Hi everyone and welcome to our second live event for National Sewing Circle. Um, if you're tuning in again and you, you watch this the first time, welcome back. And if it's, this is the first time you're joining us, um, welcome. If you're unfamiliar, we're going to be answering your sewing questions live for the next hour. And we have the wonderfully talented Nikki LaFoyle here with us tonight to answer questions. So hi Nikki. Hi everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to answer all of your sewing questions. We have a lot of questions that were submitted prior to this event, and if you think of any questions uh, that you want to ask us over the next hour, feel free to enter those into the box underneath this video, and we're going to work our way through as many questions as we can possibly get to. So we're going to get started right away. Um, we have a lot of questions that deal with um, fabric or just getting into sewing or altering patterns. So our first question is, I'm completely new to this. I have never owned a sewing machine, and I don't even know how to sew. What machine should I buy, and where do I start? That is a tough one um, as far as what machine to buy because there are so many out there. Um, but good for you getting into interested in sewing. It's a great skill to know. Uh, it's really fun. So um, my sewing machine actually is just kind of this little one. Uh, I just went on Amazon actually and looked up the best seller. Um, and it was one of the best sellers because it was so inexpensive. Um, and, uh, you know, decently durable. It's got, like, 59 built-in stitches, straight stitch, zigzag stitch, buttonhole. That's really, like, all I really need. Um, so it's, um, that one's a, a little brother. But you can go on Amazon and look up reviews. You can go to dealers and test drive some and see what you like. Um, but... If you're just starting out and you don't know kind of which direction you want to go, if you want to go with quilting or garments or embroidering, um, test some out and um, go with something kind of inexpensive so that you can grow and upgrade. Um, but just make sure um, you've got your, your straight stitch and your zigzag stitch, and that's really all you need to get started. Um, and there are a lot of resources out there to when you're starting to get into sewing. Um, or tutorials and things like that. National Sewing Circle has a bunch. Um, there are a lot of free resources um, on YouTube. You can Google or search on YouTube anything that you want to learn, and um, some results will probably come up. Absolutely. And I think you touched on a, a really important part when picking your first machine is that you want something that you can grow with and be able to keep using um, in the future so you don't have to keep buying more. So. We have some questions here about um, actually sewing items. So when sewing an item that requires a lining, do you sew the lining separate and then sew it with the actual piece, or what is the best way to sew a lining? Yes, so when you're doing a lining, it's kind of like constructing two of the same garment. So if you're doing a skirt, you would construct the skirt out of the skirt fabric and then do the same thing in the lining. Um, typically, you might want to do the lining just like a skosh smaller. Um, use just a tiny little bit of um, a, like a larger seam allowance so that it will fit nicely under the main garment. Um, so if it was a skirt, you know, you would finish the hem on both pieces and, you know, the hem on the lining would be a little bit shorter than the hem on the, the skirt to keep it from being seen. And then you would finish the upper edges um, within the waistband. And the same thing if you were doing uh, a blazer or a jacket, you would construct one of the main fabric and one of the lining and um, stitch together around the lapel and then tuck the lining inside of the blazer. Perfect. Okay. Um, and since you mentioned skirts, we have a quick question that came in here. And this one might be a little bit difficult because I know people have preferences when it comes to patterns and pattern brands and things like that. Um, but Karen asks, can you recommend any simple full skirt pattern for an extra large woman? That's a good question. Um, whole skirts. That's a really good one to do, um, do a Google search on because I know there are lots of um, <clears throat> full skirts in you know, the, the main pattern companies, Simplicity and Vogue and Butterick um, and those. But there are also a ton of really good um, independent pattern companies that are starting to put out a lot more patterns. So you can do a search on those and see what comes up. 
Absolutely, and a lot of times you can find um, free patterns too on people's blogs or, or other websites like that. So definitely things with like skirt patterns where it's easy to draft a pattern off your measurements, they might be providing those kind of things for free versus like a jacket or something. So I would definitely search that and see what you can find. Okay. All right, so now we have a question that asks, how do you shorten the sleeve of a jacket with a lining? We have a lining theme going on here. <laughs> Um, so I was actually, I was looking for my a blazer I made earlier and I couldn't find it, but so hopefully I'll be able to explain this right. Um, so in the, the sleeve, you've got the lining attached to the cuff, uh, probably a couple inches in from the cuff of the actual blazer. Um, you'd want to take that seam out and um, remove however much you need to shorten it from the, the blazer fabric and the lining fabric and press, press that under to the right length. And then I would hand stitch it um, because otherwise you would have to take out the stitching um, that stitches the lining to the coat on the bottom to get in there to machine stitch the sleeve again. So I would just hand stitch it so you, you know, don't mess with taking out any other seams um, and do a little slip stitch um, to reattach the lining to the blazer um, after you've shortened it. Perfect. Okay, we have a, another new question here. Um, Wendy asks, I'm new to sewing and I'm having a hard time learning how to read a pattern. There are many terms, phrases, and acronyms that I'm not familiar with. Where can I find information on how to interpret and read a pattern? That's a good question and that's something that beginner um, sewists find a lot is difficult to read commercial patterns. It seems like a different language. Um, but I, I think some commercial patterns will have uh, like a key um, as to like what the um, the symbols on the pattern mean, and if they don't, you can also type that into your search bar, and um, I I'm pretty sure there will be there will be answers out there. But um, a lot of commercial patterns will have a key for you, so so make sure you read the guide sheet um, before you start doing anything. Read that um, and see if that'll answer any questions, and then you can start searching elsewhere for answers. Absolutely, and, and the good thing about um, some of those terms and things is that they're pretty universal throughout different pattern companies, so a notch is a notch on one pattern and on another, so you don't have to worry about learning terms for one pattern and then you know changing and learning for a different pattern too, so once you get them down, they're kind of all the same across the board. Um, all right, another new question here. Uh, Jane says, I just bought some eyelet cotton for a blouse, and then realize that the collar will need interfacing. What is the best way to deal with this when you can see through the material? That's a good question. Um, so you can um, either maybe instead of using interfacing or in addition to using interfacing, you can put um, get some plain cotton of the same color and um, cut another uh, collar out of that cotton so that you'll see just the the white if it's a you know white eyelet or new color have a color showing through rather than the interfacing showing through. Perfect. Are you um, just just because I thought of it? This is what I would think of using as a fabric, like a spray stiffener. Would you ever use? I mean, I know it's kind of more temporary, but could you use something like that instead? Um, like you said, that's temporary and it would probably you know wash out with washing and you wouldn't want to have to you know, do it every time you wear it to get your collar to stand nicely. Right. So something more permanent to sew in there probably. Perfect. All right. Uh, our next question is going back to adding a lining. Shannon asks, how do you put a zipper in a skirt with a lining? It's a good question. Um, so I'm trying to think back on how I've done it. Um, so you would leave the the lining open um, for the length of the zipper. Sew the zipper into the um, the main fabric of the skirt, and then um, I think I've hand stitched the lining to a zipper. I think that's the easiest way to do it. Um, just uh, you know, open up that opening of the lining to be next to the zipper teeth and stitch that in and then finish the upper edge within the waistband. 
Perfect. I think you definitely I agree with the hand stitching because you. I like to do hand stitching on places where you can't see it, so it doesn't have to. You don't have to worry about it as much. So lining is a perfect place to do hand stitching. All right, we're going to go back to your question, um, previous question about shortening a blazer sleeve. And Carolyn asks, how do you shorten the sleeve when it has a vent? That is a good question. And without seeing it, um, that would probably be hard for me to answer because um, you, know, you can do sleeves would ha can have slits and vents um, without really looking at it. I'd have a hard time answering that. I wouldn't want to give any advice and have it be super wrong. Ashley, do you have any thoughts? I mean, it, exactly. I think um, other than if you could somehow maybe cut the vent up a little bit and then also fold that under and stitch it in um, just so you're uh, making sure that you're, you're not shortening the sleeve and then not shortening the lining. But other than that, yeah, I agree with you. Um, if that's something that you could see, it's a lot easier to figure out how to adjust that. But... All right, we have a few more questions on how to sew things and fix things. Um, what is the best way to finish a neckline with a bias binding? Um, to do necklines with binding, I, I have uh, seen some tutorials that say to uh, join the binding ends first and then attach that circle to the neckline, and I don't like to do it that way simply because... Um, I like to have a larger margin for error uh, when stitching, so I will leave, uh, you know, a long length of binding. Start at the center back um, and stitch uh, the binding around the neckline, and then at the end, um, to join them, stitch about like an inch over the beginning, um, and then fold both of those over to the wrong side and um, stitch in the ditch to finish. Perfect. And um, I, the term you just used, that's a question we also got earlier, is stitch in the ditch, and they want to know what that means and what that is. Yeah, so stitching in the ditch just means um, to stitch right uh, on top of a seam that you just stitched. So a lot of times it's used either like in binding quilts um, or uh, binding edges or like a waistband. So uh, if it was a waistband, um, so you've got, you stitch the waistband, uh, to the upper edge of skirt, folded it over, and then um, stitch right from the right side, with the right side facing up, <clears throat> stitch right in that seam that you just stitched between the waistband and the skirt. So that's the ditch, you know, stitching in the ditch. And that's to catch the waistband um, on the wrong side to finish it. Perfect. And do they, they make like special feet and stuff for that too that kind of help you um, stay in that ditch, right? Yeah, um, they have, this is not a stitch in the ditch book, but it's kind of the same. So it's got this little uh, flange on the bottom. So that would go like right in the, in the ditch and kind of help guide your stitching um, very centered. Perfect. All right, we have um, another question here on altering clothing. Um, and since it's, you know, summertime around, people are saying uh, they have a summer knit top and the armholes are too big. How do they fix it? Good question. Um, so there are a couple things you can do. You can, um, if your armhole is too big, you can add a dart um, in the arm's eye here, kind of by the bust, um, to just pinch a little bit of that fabric in. And if that um, pulls your side seam forward in a way that is displeasing to you, you can also do a little uh, pinch a little dart in the back to even that out. And if it's not um, if it's not a huge difference in the armhole, you can um, take it in at the side seam. If you have a little bit um, of wiggle room, you know, down here, you can just pinch a little bit in at the side seam and um, pinch that out of the armhole and taper it down toward your waist. Perfect. All right, I just want to remind anybody, you know, if you're just, just joining us or maybe you've even been with us from the beginning, um, we're answering our questions live for the next hour. So if you think of anything that you want to ask or even a follow-up on anything we're talking about, just enter that into the comment section uh, underneath this video, and we are going to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, so our next question here is, how do you replace old elastic in slacks? That's a, another good question. Um, elastic will sometimes get old and not stretching for you. So um, if it is just tunneled elastic, um, unless it's threaded through a waistband, you can remove 
uh, an inch or two of the stitching um, at the back or somewhere inconspicuous and cut that elastic, pull it out, and just as if you were making a uh, waistband from scratch, uh, measure new elastic around your waist, making sure it's snug but not too tight, and uh, making sure you take into account it's going to be, you want to overlap um, the elastic ends about an inch. Um, cut and cut the elastic to that measurement. Um, put a safety pin in one end, and I will also sometimes put a safety pin in the opposite end and pin it to the pants so that I don't accidentally lose the other end in the waistband as I'm pushing it through the, the tunnel. Um, so using the safety pin, push your elastic through and then overlap um, about an inch, making sure it's not twisted anywhere. And I like to join the elastic ends um, using just like stitching a rectangle around that overlap. And you can use, use a straight stitch for that. Um, and then reclose the waistband opening, just stitching right over that stitching that you took out, and um, evenly distribute the gathers, and should be good to go. Perfect. And I'm now I'm going to ask a follow up on this one, just because I I was replacing elastic in um, not slacks, but a, a waistband a little while ago, and a lot of times um, when you buy a store bought, they'll actually stitch the elastic to the pants on the sides. So how do you take that out without ruining your waistband? Um, you should be able to just very carefully use your seam ripper and pick that stitch out since it shouldn't be attached um, to any other seams. It, it should it would probably just be you know a little stitching line on the side seams or something to keep the elastic from twisting. So you should probably be able to just take your seam ripper and carefully pick that out. Okay, yeah, that's what I did. But it's just something like if you don't know it's there and you're trying to pull your elastic out, just check and see if you know it's stitched on the sides and that might be what's catching it. All right, so again, you know, still we want people to be commenting on our video and joining us and connecting with us now, but we also want you to connect with us, connect with us in the future. Um, and you can do that on social media, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and of course you can sign up for our free newsletter at nationalsewingcircle.com um, so you can ask your questions anytime uh, they pop into your head. So our next question here is from Lisa, and she says, what are some tips to getting a quarter inch seam when you don't have a quarter inch foot? Um, I actually don't have a quarter inch foot. So what I do, Lisa, um, I, watch, um, on my, I watch a point on my presser foot. Um, I try to align it either with the edge of the presser foot or you know, the, the inner edge of the foot, depending on where my needle is. And a lot of machines, you have the option of moving your needle. So if you want to be able to watch the edge of your presser foot and align your um, quarter-inch fold with that, you can bump your needle one way or the other um, so that you will get your quarter-inch and make sure you, you, know, you measure with your ruler um, as you bump, you're bumping your needle over to make sure you get your quarter-inch. Perfect. And then I, I like to put a little piece of tape on my machine so I remember, so I don't have to keep going back and measuring every time. It's always there. An excellent idea, Ashley. All right. Now we have a question here that someone wants to know how they can remove creases in fabric from the fabric stores. Yeah, those creases, they really set in uh, when the fabric is wound around the bolt. Um, so you want to wash your fabric when you take it home, and that a lot of times will remove any of the excess chemicals um, and dyes, finishes that um, the manufacturer has put um, on the fabric to keep it, you know, from getting dirty and, and shipping and things like that. Um, so that will help get the crease out. Um, if you're able to dry the fabric, throw it in the dryer um, on low, and that heat will also help. Um, and then press it. If you're able to steam the fabric, steam, steam, steam the heck out of it. Um, and if you can't steam the fabric, um, you know, you can try using an iron on low heat from the wrong side. You can put heavy books on it for a couple days if it's a really stubborn crease. But um, with most fabrics, I have found uh, a good wash and dry and a good pressing will do go a long way in taking out those creases. Perfect. We're going to move on to thread here. We have a question that says, 
I'm a bit confused about the weight of thread, type of threads for what fabric, and the types and sizes of needles. Could you explain this for me? Yeah. Uh, so for general sewing, an all-purpose thread will be fine. Um, if you're sewing cotton, poly, rayon, acetate, an all-purpose thread is fine, which is just a, um, it's a uh, cotton core spun or wrapped in polyester. Uh, which is great. It's got a little bit of stretch, um, so you can use it with knits. <clears throat> and that's the only real thing that I would say is, if you're sewing with knits, don't use a 100% cotton thread because it doesn't have the, the stretch to move with the knit fabric. Uh, use an all-purpose thread um, or a, a polyester thread. Um, if you are using a lightweight or delicate fabric, you might want to use a silk thread, which is lightweight and very strong, or um, a fine thread. Sometimes at the store they just call it a fine thread or a lightweight thread. Um, <clears throat> and as far as needles, um, a size, uh, when you buy a pack, a lot of times they come in, you, have, you get like a size 90, 80, and 70. So size 80 is kind of just a medium size needle, and that will work for most of your general sewing projects. Uh, but if you're using a, um, <clears throat> a thicker fabric, you might want to go up uh, to a size 90, which just will have a stronger shaft, um, and you won't get needle breakage quite as much. And if you're using a more delicate fabric, you might want to go down to a size 70. I was sewing satin the other day, which um, has the risk of snagging. So I used the thinnest needle that I had in my stash, which is size 70. Um, but they do go thinner, I think. They go to 65 at least, um, I've seen. Um, I think that's kind of the basics. Uh, yeah, as far as needles and thread, absolutely. And my, my favorite part about picking needles is that they're all like labeled what they are when you go to buy them. So you know what you're sewing. You know, if you're going for sizes and you want to pick your universal or if you're sewing, you know, denim, it says denim or, you know, things like that. So that helps you out a lot when it comes to picking. Yeah, if you're sewing, sewing leather, choose a leather needle. Uh, if you're sewing on something stretch, use a stretch or a jersey needle. Yeah, they're, they're named very aptly. Perfect. All right, we have another question here about thread. And Lynn asks, I inherited a lot of very good threads from my mother. Some are several years old. Are they usable? Yeah, so that's pretty um, case by case. Um, generally, if if threads were stored well, um, away from light and not in a wet place, um, they will have aged just fine, and you can use them. Um, as long as, you know, your machine is in good condition, you're using the right needle and everything, you shouldn't have any thread breakage. Um, but if you start encountering thread breakage and you have gone through your checklist of, is my machine clean, uh, is it threaded right, and all these things, uh, you will want to take the thread age into consideration. Um, it might be deteriorating a little bit, and some higher quality threads will age better than lower quality threads. So keep it in the back of your mind. Um, I think it's probably fine to use older thread um, until you start to notice some um, thread breakage and then just uh, yeah, keep that in mind as a, an option to, to check if that's what's causing your thread breakage is an older thread. All right. And do you use any kind of thread conditioners at all, like a sewer's aid or anything? Would you use that? I have never used that um, because, you know, your thread is, it's going to be washed and, you know, those things are going to wash away and your thread, you're going to want it to stand up to years of using whatever you've made. So uh, you want it to be sturdy on its own without any, uh, any conditioners that might wash away over time. That's true. That's a good idea, yes. All right, we have a, a question that just came in here. Um, Lynn asks, how do you sew a curved hem on a knit top? <clears throat> a curved hem. <clears throat> um, so knits a lot of times are very malleable, so you um, might be able to press it up in your curve just fine. If it's a very... Um, 
a very angled curve, you might need to throw a line of basting stitches along the edge. And um, if you're doing a curved hem on a woven, that's what you would do with a line of basting stitches. Um, a quarter inch from the raw edge probably and pull those up um, and then fold that uh, toward the wrong side and press and that'll um, allow you to get a curved edge. Perfect. So we're getting tons of great questions so I just want to again remind you if you're just joining us and you think of a question that you want to ask or a follow-up to anything we're talking about put it in the comment section below and we'll keep working our way through um, and even if you think of something you know an hour after we're done, go ahead and connect with us on social media, on Facebook, uh, Pinterest, Twitter, uh, or sign up for our free newsletter. You can send us emails um, through our site there. So always connect with us now and in the future. Um, our new question here, uh, Denise asks, do you have any tips on making a perfect cowl neck collar? Cowl necks. I love cowl necks. I love wearing them. Um, I haven't actually made any cowl necks. Um, so I don't have too many tips. Um, Ashley, have you ever made a cowl neck? Um, honestly, so I, I do a lot of crocheting, so I would probably just crochet a cowl and wear it over it with something, but I would say just make sure your fabric kind of is drapey enough to where it looks good as the cowl and isn't too yeah. stiff or constricting at all, but, um, other than that, yeah, I haven't, haven't made a whole lot of them either, but I would, yeah, definitely, I think fabric selection is, a big one on getting a good cowl collar. All right, our next question here is, how do we find the grain line on stretch fabric? Yeah, so um, grain line on fabric is not as uh, important to take into consideration as with a woven, um, as far as the lengthwise or the crosswise grain. You just want to make sure that the, uh, the straight grain with the largest stretch is going around your body. Um, so you can find the grain um, by, if you look closely at your knit fabric, you can see um, little lines of, you know, little V's going down, which is um, the loops made from the knit construction. And that is your grain line. So um, I usually fold over an edge of my knit and try and get that straight along one of those V's. Um, to straighten up my knit fabric. And if you're, you know, one rib or two off here or there, it's not a big deal. Um, just make sure it's not, you know, so far off that you're cutting on the bias. That's going to really skew your seams. So just find that V, and um, that's your, your one of your grain lines, and just make sure the test it, the side with the greatest stretch is going to go widthwise um, across your body. Perfect. Okay, another question here about some stretch fabrics. Uh, someone wants to know if patterns for knit-only fabrics can be adjusted for woven fabrics. That's a really good question. Um, generally, I would say no, but if you look at the pattern, um, <clears throat> you might be able to, in some instances, use um, a knit pattern for a woven fabric. Um, so you want to make sure, look at your closures. So um, on a knit, you're not going to have as many closures as you would um, on a woven. So you might have to add you know, a zipper in the back or some buttons um, if you want to use that knit pattern, use a woven fabric for that knit pattern. Um, you want to look at um, like the neckline opening. Um, the knit fabric is going to have more stretch, so it's going to stretch over your head. Um, you could um, just go up a couple of sizes um, in the knit pattern to, um, to open things up for the woven fabric, but then you want to make sure, you know, once that neckline goes over your head, is it going to be, you know, too big and loose around your neck? Um, so take that into consideration, and conversely, using a knit fabric for a woven pattern, um, you want to look at the same thing. Uh, look at your closures. So um, in woven patterns, you're going to have openings like uh, if you have a button placket for your woven uh, pattern, is your knit sturdy enough to be able to hold up a button placket? Maybe not. Maybe you should eliminate it altogether or um, 
Um, um, another consideration, sorry, uh, is uh, seams. So woven patterns, if you got like princess seams or a yoke or something, um, stitching a lot of seams in a knit fabric uh, might not um, give you the best look. So it might be bulkier um, and things like this. So there are a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, generally, I would say no, but in some instances, you could. Perfect. Okay. Um, our next question here, uh, since we're talking about making clothes, is how can I make homemade clothes look less homemade and more professional? Good question. So one of the things you can do is um, on hems, uh, on hems of ready-made, you know, store-bought t-shirts, you've got um, that surged hem look, um, and you can replicate that uh, using a, a twin needle, so you can get the two lines of stitching even if you don't have a serger. Um, so having those two lines of stitching instead of just, you know, one line of straight stitches or um, a zigzag stitch on your hem um, can add a little professional touch. Um, I think that's um, that's a big one. Ashley, do you have any other suggestions? I, my big thing with, um, that my mom hammered into me from like the very beginning of learning how to sew garments is making the inside look as pretty as the outside so it comes down to seam finishes. So if someone were to look really closely at something, um, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was just a homemade. So I'd, I'd say seam finishes would be a big one. So. And that leads us perfectly into our next question, which is how do you sew flat felt seams? Flat felt seams. Okay, I'm glad you we got to this one because I made a sample. <laughs> well, flat felt seam, if you look at your jeans, the flat felt seam is um, what they use on the outside of your, your side seam on your jeans. It's a really strong, sturdy finish. They use it a lot in menswear as well. Um, and it's really easy to do, very sturdy. You can use it on the right or the wrong side of the fabric, actually. So you start by just stitching the seam. So um, right or wrong sides together, actually. Um, stitch your seam, 5 8 inch seam allowance, whatever you're using. And then you want to trim one of your seam allowances down about a half. And then on the other seam allowance, so this one is trimmed down. On the other seam allowance, you're going to fold it over um, and press. And you want to fold it actually over this other seam allowance that you've trimmed down and fold it over right to the seam line. And then fold that over that way so you've encased that seam allowance. And then you're going to just edge stitch um, that fold right there. And it looks great from both sides. Um, you can use it, so if you use it on the wrong side, then the right side is a little bit flatter. You've just got that line, one line of top stitching next to the seam. If you use it on the right side, it looks a little bit more raised. Um, so it's going to look a little bit more like um, the side seam of your denim. So it's got a little bit of a, an effect there. Um, but it's a really nice sturdy seam. It encases those seam allowances. Um, and it can be a little bit of a decorative element, too, to have that top stitching um, of that fold next to the seam. Perfect. Now, I know you might not have a sample for this one, but it goes along with it. Um, and a lot of people maybe either don't know the difference or don't know uh, what is a flat felt seam versus French seam construction. So can you kind of explain um, the difference between those two? Yeah, so a French seam um, is kind of done um, a little bit of the same way, but for French seam, you always start with the wrong sides together. And you stitch the seam using whatever seam allowance you're using, um, and then you trim both of the seam allowances down to, generally, I do trim it down to a quarter inch, um, and then press it open, and then press it with the, um, then the right sides together, and then stitch the seam again. So that encases the seam allowances as well, um, but it's a little different. It doesn't have the you know, the decorative element on the outside. It looks just the very same from the outside, but it's a good way to finish and encase your seam allowances so the inside of your garment looks just as pretty as the outside. And it's one of those that you can, you know, do as you go rather than make your whole garment and then go back and finish it. So if you want to save a little bit of time that way, that works too. 
All right, speaking of seam allowances and garments, Donna says, I follow the measurements on the pattern envelope to my measurements, but my garments are always too big. I use a 5 8 inch seam allowance. How can I correct this? So um, pattern companies do that. Um, even if you follow the measurements, your, your size exactly, um, it's probably going to be a little bit big. And they do that so that patterns will fit the widest range of people possible. So really, the, the main the main answer I have to that is make a fitting sample first using a fabric that is similar in uh, weight and drape and everything to the fabric that you're going to use for the final one. Make a fitting sample and try it on and um, make any alterations you need to to that and transfer it onto the pattern. Um, but you now patterns, they're, they're not going to fit you right straight out of the bat. You're going to have to do some alterations probably. Absolutely. It's always um, you either fit you know one section of the measurements or another better so you kind of have to go between some of the sizes sometimes too. So um, I just want to remind anybody who maybe is just joining us uh, and we just just decided to hop on and start listening that if you have any questions that you want to ask go ahead and put it in the comment section below the video and we're going to continue working through as many questions as we can for the next half hour or so. Um, and then even after this, if you want to connect with us on social media, on Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's free. It's at nationalsewingcircle.com and connect with us in the future as well. Um, so moving on with our questions, uh, Liz says, what is your suggestion for sewing round corners? This has always been challenging for me. For sewing round corners, um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, my main tip would be to uh, go slow and make small corrections um, and lift the presser foot and pivot around the corner um, just in very, very small increments so that you don't get any sharp corners, but um, so that it kind of blends into a smooth seamless corner. Just go slow and you know lift the presser foot and pivot a little bit each time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm a big proponent of drawing on there. I'm better following a drawn line than I am at eyeballing anything. <laughs> so that, that always helps out too. All right, we have a question here, um, and they say that they make aprons with a pocket on the front, and they want to know how to make the pocket match the fabric pattern so it blends in. Good question. And I'm not sure if fussy cutting would be the right term for that, but that's what comes to mind. So you're, you're matching the pattern of the pocket to the, the pattern on the apron. So you can just find um, the placement uh, wherever on the apron you want the, the pocket to go. Find that pattern repeat from that spot um, on your extra fabric and cut your pocket piece uh, right there to match um, the fabric of the apron that you're putting the pocket on. Is that yep. kind of yeah, well, yeah, and I was just going to say, uh, the one thing to remember when, always buy extra fabric. Yeah. You, never, you know, it's never going to line up perfectly, so I always buy, and I like to add to my fabric stash, so I buy extra fabric anyway, but for, for things like that, it's always good to have some extra. Um, next question here is, how do you do a mitered corner? Ooh, I have a sample for this, too, because I thought you would. It would be really hard to explain without a sample. That's the problem with the, a sewing Q&A is so, many, so much of it is hands-on and demonstrative. Um, okay, so you've got your, or whatever it is that you're binding, and here's your, your binding that you align with your raw edge. So you're stitching along this raw edge, stitching your binding to your, your uh your project and you want to stop at the corner um, your seam allowance away from this edge. So if you're using a half inch seam allowance you stop a half inch from this edge. And then you're going to fold this up at a 45 degree angle and then back down over itself to align with the next edge. And then to stitch this edge you can start just right at that raw edge and um, stitch that next edge. You do the same thing for each corner. So it would look like this. So let's see which way did I go. So I stitched up here, folded this down, 
and then you can start right at the raw edge there and stitch across. And then when you fold that toward the wrong side, you're going to get that nice looking miter. And then on the wrong side, so if you, you know, flat ahead of time, you would have folded this under. Or if you're, if you were using a double fold binding, it would already be folded. Um, so you're going to have to, on the wrong side, just kind of fold that using your fingers into, um, into that miter. And then stitch in the ditch from the right side is how I always do it. Or you can hand stitch um, the fold on the back to secure it. So that's how you do a miter. And it seems kind of scary when you're starting out, but the technique is actually um, pretty easy once you do it a couple times and, and get used to it. Absolutely. I love your sample, by the way. I've made it perfectly easy to see. Yeah. All right. Our next question here is from Elizabeth, and she says, can a zipper be put in a patio cushion that has already been made, like one from the store? Totally. Um, for that, I think an exposed zipper would be really cool, and it would be um, easy to put in. So um, you can just lay that zipper along the edge where you want it to go, uh, stitch down each side you know, and across the bottom, and um, cut an opening for yourself and, you know, finish those opening edges. But um, an exposed zipper would look cool and would be really easy to put into something pre-made like that. Perfect. Okay, we have a couple questions about hems. And our first one is, how do you blind stitch on your sewing machine, as in to hem a dress? Blind stitch. I have a sample for this as well. Um, so this, the foot that I showed earlier, is actually a blind stitch foot. So it's got that flange on the bottom. So, um, to blind stitch, you're going to want to fold up your hem. Um, so, however you fold up your hem, you know, double fold or whatever, and press. And then you're going to fold the whole thing toward the right side. So, folding it toward the right side with um, a quarter to an eighth to a quarter of an inch of this fold showing. So, this is the right side facing, this is the wrong side, so we're folding that for the right side. This is going to be uh, the bottom, the hem right here, and then the rest of your project is up here. So pin that and then put that under your presser foot going. Right. So you've got press your fabric up here. There's the actual bottom edge. Sorry, this might be hard to see. Um, but I actually... So this is what the stitch looks like. So you're stitching... Um, it's got a couple of straight stitches, and then you're stitching... Uh, it takes like a little bite into that fold. Um, I did it with paint, so hopefully you'll be able to see. But And then on the right side, it's just... If you use a thread that was matching, it just looks like um, tiny little... Uh, bites of thread. So um, it's going to be pretty invisible and you don't have to do it by hand. Um, and that, so that flange, you're stitching like this, the flange of the foot is going to go right along this fold right there to kind of guide you. Mm -hmm. so, Perfect. Hard to see. I did my best. <laughs> No, it's, and then I think um, the folding is probably the most complicated part of a blind blind head. But once you get it folded in the right direction, it really is just a, a straight stitch when you're as far as um, the mechanics of it go. And then it's just up to your your foot and your actual needle that are doing the the complicated part. Yeah, exactly. All right, our next um, question on hems. Uh, Bonnie asks, I have a problem uh, having the hems on my jackets pucker when sewing them. How do I fix this? Um, so puckered hem, um, if you are uh, using a, uh, a woven fabric, um, you want to make sure you are not um, pulling the fabric through the needle, uh, through under the needle, because that can stretch it um, and cause puckers. Uh, well, that would cause waves, actually. Um, puckers might be caused by... Um, any number of things, uh, tension settings, um, uh, that would be probably the, 
the first thing I would look at is is tension for for any kind of puckering. Mm -hmm. um, but then you know make sure you're using um, <clears throat> the right weight of thread. If you're using a thread that's too heavy on a, a lightweight lining fabric that could cause some puckering. Uh, but tension might be the, the main culprit there. Gotcha. All right, yeah, so check that. Hopefully that'll fix that problem for you. All right, our next question, um, Lynn asks, any secrets on cutting a pattern using silk or satin fabrics? How do you keep the fabric from moving around? That's tough. I just cut something out of satin, and I know how tough that can be. Um, we'll make sure that all of your fabric is on the table. Um, if any of the fabric is like falling off the table, it will you know, try and pull the rest of the fabric off. And you'll get shifting. Um, and um, pattern weights are a good thing to use in that situation. Um, using uh, pins is kind of dangerous when you're using silks uh, and satins because they can snag, they can create holes. So if you don't have pattern weights to hold the pattern down and to hold the you know, fabric layers together. Um, you can use just anything that's heavy, like a mason jar that's filled with you know, all your buttons or whatever, your water bottle. Just I did that um, actually when I was cutting out my satin, but I used water glasses. I mean, not full, but they're heavy glasses anyway, but they were the tall kind. So my tip is use something with a low, lower profile than that because I was like trying to cut around these tall water glasses. It's not a good thing. Um, but use a rotary cutter as well. That's um, that's a good thing to use to keep it from shifting. So if you're using your scissors, um, it lifts up the fabric a little bit more than if you're using a rotary cutter. And uh, make sure you move yourself around the pattern. Don't move the pattern to you know get a better angle to cut. Uh, move around the table if you can. The less shifting you can do of the pattern and the fabric, the more accurate your cups are going to be. Absolutely. I always taught too to keep the my scissors between myself and the pattern so I'm never like trying to reach all the way over a table too so that's another reason to move all the way around. It makes it a little easier. All right, I have another question here and Sarah asks um, please give us some tips for sewing minky fabrics. Some tend to stretch. Yeah, minky. Um, they do tend to stretch, so I would just say make sure that your presser foot, presser foot pressure is not too, not um, pinching down on the fabric too much because minky can be kind of wafty and thick, and if the presser foot is you know squishing that down to the feed dogs, it will have a hard time um, going through, um, and that can cause it to stretch out. So I haven't actually used minky too much, but that's uh, that's the main thing that I can think of right now. Yeah, and if you don't know how to adjust your presser foot pressure, uh, which is harder to say than I thought it was going to be, which because I don't know if I know how to get to that on my machine, so I always just put my walking foot on because I know that that is going to help um, with thicker fabrics, and I, I don't want to have to make an adjustment that I either don't know how to undo or I forget to do, and then next time I come back, it's not set how I want it to be, and it causes more you know problems than good. So I like I like a walking foot for that. All right, we have another question about sort of specialty fabrics, um, and this comes from uh, Sarah as well, and she says, how do you work with heavily beaded fabric? How do you cut it, and how do you use it in your sewing machine? The main thing to consider when using beaded or sequin fabric is that you don't want any beads or sequins in your seam allowances. So um, before you even, before you even cut out your fabric, you know, lay the pattern out on the fabric and remove the beads or the sequins from the seam allowances because you don't want to, you don't want to cut over any of it, you don't want your needle to hit any of it, and you don't want that bulk in the seam allowances when you're wearing the garment. Um, so <clears throat> you have to kind of be careful because a lot of the times beads will be stitched on, you know, many beads with the same thread. So if you cut a thread, you cut a bead off, the risk of a bunch of other beads falling off. So you can um, you can pull the thread to the wrong side and tie it off. You can use um, like fray check, but that's that's not as secure as knotting the threads. Um, 
to fray check it on the back to, to secure those threads. Um, so yeah, just removing removing those from the seam allowances and, and making sure your your threads don't all come unraveled and your beads don't all come off. Perfect. All right, so we um, we only have a few more minutes left, and so I want uh, anybody that you know is maybe saving their question for the end uh, to go ahead and put that in the comment box under this video. We're going to get through as many as we can before our hour is up. Um, and so our next question is. I like to sew yoga pants. I like to sew yoga pants. Do you have any suggestions or hints about sewing with lycra or spandex and how the pattern size is calculated? Yes. Yeah, so um, sewing spandex, and lycra is just a, a brand name for spandex, um, so you want to make sure you're using your ballpoint needle, so um, also known as a stretch or a jersey needle. Um, so that is that's just kinder to your knit fabric. Um, it doesn't cut through the threads and um, you don't have the risk of raveling or creating snags. It'll nestle in between the, the threads of your knit fabric. Um, if you have the option, uh, put on a straight stitch throat plate. Um, that will work for the vertical seams, um, but you can't do a zigzag stitch with a straight stitch throat, throat plate. And um, you'll probably want to do a zigzag stitch for the um, these seams going around your body because you want it to stretch. Um, but a straight stitch throat plate, um, uh, it just has the, the single hole for the needle to go through, um, so that prevents the fabric from getting pushed down into the throat plate and getting all gumped up in there because uh, some spandexes are, are kind of thin and um, really drapey and that can happen with those sometimes. Um, tips. If your spandex um, is stretching or if you're getting shifting uh, of the layers going under your presser foot, you can either sandwich both of those layers in between tissue paper. I like to use that tip. You can save the extra tissue paper from cutting out your pattern, um, one on top, one on the bottom of those fabric layers, and that will prevent the feed dogs from uh, grabbing onto that fabric and stretching it. <clears throat> Um, if you're getting shifting between the layers, you can also try um, putting fusible web tape along the raw edges to just fuse those seams together or baste the seams together before you sew them to prevent shifting. Um, but in the, I just made a pair of pants um, and I had a lot of shifting between the layers, so I just did fusible web tape right along the raw edges, uh, making sure that tape. Um, was well within the seam allowances so you wouldn't see it on the right side. And then since those seam allowances then are stuck together, uh, they were easier to finish with two layers instead of trying to finish one layer at a time. And then you would just press it to one side instead of pressing it open. Perfect. And yeah, a follow-up to that, they want to know if they can make a pattern from a purchased pair of leggings. Yes. Um, so yeah, the second part of that, the question before was the pattern sizing, which is very subjective to the pattern you're using, but you can make your own using leggings that you have. Just turn them right side out, um, tuck one leg into the other, and you can just trace that shape. Um, and a lot of times those ready-made leggings will be, used, will be made with a server, so some of the seam allowance will have already been cut off. So look at that seam allowance that's left, and you might want to add a little bit more um, seam allowance for when you're making your own. Okay. Um, our next question here is, I would love to know what fashion design books are the best for learning and making your own patterns. I would love to learn how to make my own patterns, but there are so many books out there. Um, what are some of your thoughts on that? There are so many books out there, and it is really hard to choose, but this book is the one that I used in college, Designing Apparel Through the Flat Pattern, and it's huge. Um, I used it all through my pattern making classes in college and it is everything I have ever needed. Um, it starts out with showing you how to make your sloper. So the basic pattern, I think it's just like a uh, kind of like a high neckline with long set and sleeves and that's your basic building block for any other patterns you want to make. And you do alterations to that sloper um, to create other looks. So this book goes through looks like A to Z, like uh, you know, petal sleeve, bishop sleeve, and dresses, and necklines, and 
it shows you step by step how to go from your slow bird to making all these different looks. So I recommend that book, Designing Apparel Through the Flat Pattern. Uh, Fairchild is the publisher. I don't know if they are putting out new versions of it, but um, I bought my news when I was in college, so hopefully they're still floating around out there. You might be able to get some good information out of it. Perfect. All right, we have a few more minutes left, and we still have some questions coming in. Um, so our next question is from Barbara, and she says, what tips do you have for cutting out a pattern in a very small space where you can't lay out the full length of the fabric at one time? Yeah, I'm working in a really small sewing room as well, so I run into that. Um, <clears throat> I have... I have taken my fabric out to the kitchen before and when it was important really to be able to lay out all of the, the fabric at one time. Um, <clears throat> but if you need to um, if you need to shift the fabric uh, as you're cutting out pattern pieces, so you know you cut out a bodice and then you have to move the fabric up onto your cutting board to cut out you know, the, the sleeve or whatever. Um, just really try and make sure you can actually um, baste the selvages together um, <clears throat> to make sure that everything stays on grain as you're you know, trying to shift the, the fabric up and on your cutting board to cut out um, the rest of the pieces. So just make sure, try and make sure the fabric doesn't shift too much um, and get you off grain. Absolutely. I've actually um, cut things out on top of, uh, laid thing, fabric out on top of my bed before to be able to lay it out. As better I can. You can't use a rotary cutter at all. You're you're stuck with your scissors. But I mean, if you really need a large space, you can you can do that too. Um, our next question again about large uh, pieces of fabric. Rita asks, what is the best way to pre-wash five yards of 60-inch fabric um, in a top-loading washer which has a center agitator? Well, that's a lot of fabric to be putting in there. It is a lot. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I guess, I mean, when washing fabric, my, my main tip is to uh, is to base the, the raw edges together so that you don't get a ton of, like, uh, and that might cut down, cut down on the wrapping of the fabric around that center agitator, but it definitely cuts down on um, the raw edges fraying. So definitely try that out. Hopefully five yards of fabric will fit in that washer. Boy, that's a lot of fabric. I'm just picturing washing bedding and stuff, just making sure you've got it as evenly spaced around there as you can, because mine is super easy to throw off balance, and you, you know, starts going all over the place. So I guess, yeah, getting it as evenly uh, distributed around it, if, if possible, would be the best way, yeah. All right, we have a few more minutes here. We have another question, um, and it says, when hemming pants uh, that are narrow all the way to the ankle, how do you prevent puckering at the bottom um, since it's a half inch from the floor in the back? Right. So down. Um, right. So I, um, I understood this question as um, the fold in the front on the top of the shoe, uh, which is actually supposed to be there. That's that's called the break, um, since you've got your uh, your hem half inch from the floor in the back, um, <clears throat> and you know your hem is straight, and since it's sitting on the top of the shoe, it's going to create a little bit of a fold. Um, so short of <clears throat> bringing the whole hem up to lessen that break a little bit, a break is um, it's inevitable and it's kind of it's a rare you know styling detail. Um, you just don't want you don't want like two folds on top of the shoe. Um, so. Uh, but that that little fold is uh, is supposed to be there on top of the shoe. If I'm understanding that question correctly. Gotcha. Okay. Well, makes sense to me. <laughs> All right. We have one more question here, um, and sort of you know finishing out and just how you would finish off a project. How would you sew or em embroider a label to customize your finished piece? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you can get you can buy labels in bulk online and um, use your uh, spray adhesive if you're embroidering um, to adhere them to the, the stabilizer in your hoop um, to embroider on them. Um, or you can um, uh, use your sewing machine to, I don't know if you'd be able to really do the same kind of, you know, 
wouldn't be able to embroider a name or something, but you could do a little logo if it's something simple, lower the feed dogs and kind of free motion around. Um, if you're doing a little label, you want to, again, adhere it to some tearaway stabilizer or something so you would have something to hold on to. Um, but you'd still be able to use your regular sewing machine to get that under the foot and do a little do a heart or, or something, a, a, a simple little shape um, to to put your own your label in your own creations. Absolutely. I love putting labels in everything. And I, I like to personalize labels depending on who you're giving it to or who you're making it for, you know, made with love or whatever you wanted to say. I think it's a fun way, especially if you're giving something as a gift. I want to thank you so much for answering all of our questions tonight. You were wonderful and had a bunch of good insight and tips. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for sending your questions in. I had a lot of fun answering them. Absolutely. Again, we really appreciate everyone who tuned in, um, watched you know, the whole thing or even just a little bit, uh, people that sent questions in ahead of time. We really appreciate um, everybody that's interacting with us. And we want you to continue interacting with us in the future, so connecting with us on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and signing up for our free newsletter at nationalsewingcircle.com and you can email us um, questions also um, through our website there and, and on any of the videos and tutorials we have. Um, and just a reminder too that maybe if you didn't catch this all the way from the beginning as soon as we are done here this will be posted on our website and you can watch the whole thing from start to finish if you want to even go back and re-listen to anything or if you missed some of the questions. So again thank you so much for everyone who joined in and thank you again Nikki for uh, answering everything and we hope you all have a good night.